I wonder if they'll hear the munching of biscuits <laughs> more than the words. <laughs> yeah, I used to work somewhere where we had, because we were about a thousand miles from one office to the other, we sort of had lots of these bits like meetings over video conference and yet yeah, you get people who would forget to switch off the mic at their end when they were just listening and you'd either get rustling or stuff or you'd hear the conversations that were going on that was supposed to be off mic yeah you yeah. know just people not quite work yet how you have to play the the kind of <laughs> the etiquette of these things shall we start yeah. okay well welcome to the um the last of our 2011-2012 series of um, seminars. We are honoured to have Simon at the price of a pack of biscuits <coughs> uh, to <coughs> talk to us about challenging the vocational education and training for development orthodoxy. Um, we've also, uh, you, you may have received a copy of a review overview of activities for the last year. If we have a few minutes at the end, we might uh, reflect on that. But I think the main purpose of the of the activity is to hear about is Simon's words of wisdom on vocational education and training and how it should be challenged. We were all in the wrong building. Oh. Tot, tot, tot. What happened? Yeah, I was thinking these people said they were coming. <laughs> come in, come in, come in. We haven't quite yet started. Yeah. yeah, we're just waiting for you. It's okay. There's tea and coffee outside if you want to quickly grab yeah. something. We can, um, <clears throat> we can wait for you to get to come and have a cup of tea. Oh, and there might be somebody listening to us from Old Farm. Yeah, there probably is. If that, there is, they? they might ask a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if so, I'll, I'm the person who will relay it from. Okay. okay. You're the oracle. Simon. Okay. Well, well, thank you all for coming. Um, for two introductory things. One is to possibly apologise in advance. I decided that I would take the plunge and try Prezi. So it may be the only time I ever ever try it as a means of of delivery. So we'll see if it works or not. So apologies if it makes you sick. I've seen really brilliant ones. I've seen really terrible ones. We'll see where, where this fits on that scale. So feedback on that will be uh, will be welcome. But I thought, well, let me let me try and do it in a way that's not would, wouldn't make me too sick. We'll see. Prezi. Uh, Prezi. Is that is that something that, uh, certainly something I haven't heard of? Yeah, it's a so, uh, it's. It's a flash player version of trying to, you know, it's it, trying to get away from linear PowerPoint, but whether it works or not, and it can be a bit zoomy, um, so we'll see. Anyway, so I'm going to try a new technology. Um, just thank you. What I think, you know, what I'll do, and probably moving on to the next slide, is sort of set up why uh, what I'm trying to do, uh, some background to the to to what I'm going to talk about. So. Vocational education and training, my perspective, I suppose, of being in a school of education, is vocational education and training doesn't get talked about hugely often in a school of education. And yet, even if you take it as a narrow sense, say as FE colleges in this country, that's still a lot of learners. You know, globally, that's tens, if not hundreds of millions of learners. But actually, my argument is everyone is engaged in vocational learning of some kind. So it's, so I'm concerned about its neglect. I'm concerned that, moreover, it's often seen as not for the likes of us, meaning the elite, that, you know, I didn't go to it, my children certainly aren't going to go to it, and it's for those people, and I frankly don't care about it. So there seems to be a kind of social justice reason for being concerned about vocational education and training. That's what got me into it. It seems to be for the people who don't matter, and often that's reflected in the attention that's paid to it in terms of design, etc. Um, but I think it's theoretically a rich area because it gets beyond learning for learning's sake, which is important, but it forces you into questions about work, about development, about the political economy in which education takes place, which of course are debates there in education, but vocational, I think, forces us to, to foreground some of those issues. So that's why I think it's important. I think the orthodox account is inadequate, and I'll come into that account shortly. Why I'm particularly interested, why, why I'm presenting on this is because this is something I've been working on recently. Well, why is that? And that's because there's a current policy moment. In the UK, although that's not my main focus, 
obviously there has been a lot of talk from this government. We've had the Wolf Report showing why vocational qualifications in school don't work. At least that's what it claims to be showing. Um, we have a whole range of reforms going into the FE colleges. We have apprenticeship being given more attention. It's a quite contradictory story. On the one hand, very pro-vocational education. On the other side, very anti it and trying to work out what's going on there and what Gove's proposals for, G, uh, for O-levels might mean and things like that. So that's not my policy setting, but it's an important one. In Europe, as John will be able to tell us, the vocational related to the lifelong has continued to be an, a very important bit of European economic and social policy. It's seen as something that can do both. But I'm talking about the international stage where this has come back onto the agenda in the last couple of years. Partly that's in the context of the Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals run out in 2015. So world targets for development. One of the targets there is education for all, uni translated as universal primary education. And as we approach that target, well, one, it's been success, and two, it's been a failure. It's kind of half glass half full, half empty. They've reached tens of millions of children who are out of school. But there's still, as they've reached those, they realise that if you get children to primary school, the questions of what happens after primary school. Do they go into the world of work at 12 or 13? Well, if you've got a, an anti-child labour policy, that's not very easy. Do they go into secondary schooling? Oh, well, old-fashioned secondary schooling was very expensive. Can we find alternatives? So vocational keeps coming back on the policy agenda there as children move through schooling. But also it's failed in the sense that there's still 61 million, if we take the figure that's being used at the moment, young people who are not in schooling who should be. Well, what's there for them? And vocational again, as in this country, vocationals for those people, so the ones that there's a problem with. So it's back on the policy agenda. Organisations like the World Bank and OECD getting involved. And this year, we've had the third International Congress on Vocational Education Training, which was in Shanghai in May. Um, linked to that, a world report on technical vocational education training, which should be out in November and a global monitoring report which is a report that looks at education for all globally this year's one is on skills for the first time and that should also be out in november so it's like buses you wait for one rep will report on vocational education and training and then two come along in the same month which given there hasn't been one for 20 years roughly is quite a, a significant and fairly stupid coming from one organization issue um that leads on then into to my own involvement in this. Um, that um, those were the people lobbying for one or two of these reports, originally just a report to be commissioned, then was asked um, by UNESCO to lead the work on the global on the <coughs> world report, which is due out in November. So tomorrow is an editing day on trying to get that report finalised. Um, but with the other report, the GMR report, I was leading, for the UK National Commission of UNESCO, I was leading the UK policy of, uh, process of consultation on that. So we had a meeting 18 months ago, what should, they produced terms of reference of a page, what should, we were, I was bringing together association of colleges and various other organisations, city and guilds, to talk about what should be in the report, then to comment on a first draft, and in... November we'll hopefully be host we should be hosting the national launch of, of the GMR this year um, in the school so I've been very involved in this process of thinking about these things and one of the things I've got to do over summer is write a briefing for the um, Secretary of State in DFID about what all this means for British policy so it's an area that is a current global policy issue and because I've been working on it for 20 years, I've become quite involved in that policy process. So that's kind of the, the background, why this, why now. What I want to do now is, is do a very schematic review of the literature. And I'm going to be extremely schematic and extremely selective. I'm going to leave out strands of literature that I know some of you work in, but they don't fit my storyline particularly well in the paper, I mention them in passing to, to show, oh yes, of course I know about that literature, but that's not my story. 
but don't complain that I don't know about it. So I'll try and deal with a few of those, but here I'm not even going to do that. I'm going to say essentially three main camps in thinking about vocational education training and policy. What's it for? Over the last 30, 25, 30 years, and I'm going to go through each of these in turn. So the dominant approach, given that it's the dominant approach in global political economy anyway, is a neoliberal approach. And this has certain key elements to it. At the heart of it is human capital theory. That it makes economic sense for individuals to invest in their skills, in their education, because this will bring economic returns. And if you go into FE colleges in this country, you will very quickly see this is a discourse. You'll see the posters on the walls about, you know, if you if you do become a plumber, particularly a plumber, you'll earn this. Here is the return on your investment. So it's a language about a return on investment. And I want to argue that this links very quickly into a language of productivism, which is a term that Giddens used in 94 to talk about how the world kind of puts the emphasis now on productivity, on formal work in and neglects other things. And obviously that's a very gendered thing. It says men's work, men's formal work is valued, women's work in the household, other kinds of work are not valued. So there's big problems with how that works. And it says some things are valuable. Community development's not valuable unless there's an economic cost to it and benefit to it. So it's a, a system that focuses in on these two main arguments. If you get training, you'll become more productive and that will benefit the economy because you'll get economic growth. And the second, that skills lead to employability. One of the big discourses of the last decade in further education internationally has been that of employability. And we've seen it come into higher education recently as, as Sarah's been working on. You know, that it's, the qualification itself isn't enough and it's not the workplaces or the, the economy's fault, the labour market's fault. It's your fault for not having the right skills and attitudes to be out there and, and employed. So there's a lot of things going on there that we, you know, we don't need to get into in this particular <laughs> seminar because a lot of you, you know that. So an argument that skills lead to employability and that will lead to jobs. So we should invest in skills, but seeing this in a very narrow, it's about employability, it's about the job to be got next week when you finish the course, it's about defining the world in terms of what's economically productive rather than what be, might be socially productive or what might be societally productive, um, um, sorry, environmentally productive. So it's a narrow, narrow vision of what counts and what doesn't count. And I've got quite a long quote from Anderson in the paper which talks about the things that are included and excluded as a result of that. The neoliberal account, then the, ne the, the kind of obverse of that investment decision is what if that investment decision doesn't make sense? And where the literature's gone <coughs> in Africa in particular is the investment doesn't pay off. If you want a good job, a good job's white collar, a good job needs good schooling. So don't waste your time in vocational education and training, which is low status. Spend your time in good academic education because that's where the return comes. So a literature with George Sakharopoulos, at the, who was at the World Bank for many years in charge of education, being the key person, showing that the rates of return to vocational education and training in Africa did not work. Now there are huge methodological problems with how you compare, you know, even if you think now, as the economy has changed, what can you extrapolate about the likely career earnings of someone leaving an educational program at this time? How can you extrapolate that from 20 years ago, which are now the people who you can measure in the workplace? So the big question is that if both supply and demand are changing radically, can you say anything about this? And there are also very technical issues about how you estimate it. But the data is actually largely 30 to 40 years old, but we're still basing global policies off literature that's hugely outdated, based on, on incomplete surveys, typically from the 1970s, but they're now an orthodoxy. And so we don't need to redo the work because it was proven in 1975 that this was true. So 
that's been the problem. The rates of return show that vocational education <coughs> training doesn't work, but there's still a policy problem that we need to do something out there. The key document at the global level was a World Bank report in 1991, which took this argument. At the same time as the bank and other agencies were saying primary education is the answer. This then led them on to a critique of public vocational education training. Trainers are divorced from industry contexts. Equipment is outdated and old fashioned. Uh, unit costs are very high because you can only have a few learners in a workshop. The curriculum is outdated because it's set by a ministry of education rather than by industry needs. So this is bad quality, inefficient, ineffective education. But the bank sort of stopped short of saying, so we should get rid of it all, because that was politically a bit too brave a step. And they can still push loans because countries are happy to reform their systems. So it led to a critique of public vocational education training, which in a sense went two ways. In Latin America, it led to a massive privatization of public systems and the rise of vouchers and other schemes to create a market. In, also in, in the African informal sectors, particularly in West Africa, it led to a lot of <coughs> schemes to try and use the informal sector um, to produce the trainers. So the people who were doing the training informally to try and link them into a formal system would make that private. The Latin American was largely successful, as long as you asked the questions in the right way. The African projects were largely unsuccessful because there were massive problems of corruption. In Kenya, not picking on the Kenyans in the room, um, but surprisingly enough, if you came with um, a fistful of dollars and you said to a trainer, a potential trainer and a potential trainee, would you like this money for training? What was found was they quite liked the money and then they would both sign to say that the training had taken place because the money was actually what they wanted rather than the training. But because the bank was so desperate to pass the money on that it didn't have the, the um, measures in place. And there's a longer story where I was part of the group who had the consultancy to do the evaluation till it went to a senior official's office and we didn't, my, our Kenyan leader didn't understand what was being asked of him in the in the negotiation for signing the contract and so we didn't sign because we chose not to not to pay the bribe and so we didn't get the contract so that kind of led to alarm bells right at the start of the process for us and the bank subsequently found that these problems were in it then elsewhere it's led to a, a new public management approach to reforming vocational education training, which essentially is lifted from the English FE experience and the English schools experience in many ways. So what I call, in, in, in VET terms, a VET toolkit, there's a series of tools that you can take if you want to have a national policy. I was talking to someone in South Africa yesterday, Somalia is, is engaged on doing some of this stuff. Afghanistan has got most of this in place, <coughs> i.e. it's in reports from consultants that this is what we're going to do. So we're taking the English system, or ver varieties of it, with a bit of, bit of Australian, a bit of Scottish to make it sound like it's nice, and we're putting it down and saying, you know, this is the way to do it. So we need some systemic governance reforms. So you need to have governing councils for provider institutions, you need to set up national bodies, possibly sector level bodies, so you won't have corruption and you won't have capture by civil servants. And you need to get industry at the heart of that. You have to set up a qualifications framework. Even though ILO re review of the evidence two years ago found very little evidence that qualification frameworks work. There's a lot of evidence they don't work, but they're the orthodoxy. You have to, of course, set up quality assurance systems. You have funding reforms that move you from a front-loaded you get this amount of money because you're an institution through, you get this amount of money because you've got this amount of students, through to eventually being results based. And you have this language of managed autonomy. We want to take the civil servants, the local education authority, it sounds a bit familiar. We want to take that level out and give autonomy to the institution, 
But we're going to manage it by giving them lots of targets, lots of things they have to report back on, and they won't get the money unless they do what they're told. So it's autonomy, but it's pretty heavily managed at the same time. So it's a set of reforms that's very familiar to, to people in, in, in the British system, I think. And of course, there've been a set of critiques, which I'm going to call neo-Marxist. They certainly started off, though, they got diluted over time. Many of you, you know, can think back to classic literature of the mid-70s, uh, Paul Willis, Bowles and Gintis. You know, education is reproduction of the class system. So there's a big literature, and vocational education is there for those people who have failed in the school system to keep them quiet, to put them somewhere safe in the system, and it's functional for capitalism. So that was the first strand of it. And then the second strand, and, and Braverman, um, John will remember Braverman, yeah. Great John. Was, was you know, the, the key person on this, the skilling thesis, that capitalism also over time tends to a tailless <laughs> reduction of the skill level. It's in the boss's interest to reduce workers' skills so they can pay them less. And, you know, so a Marxist critique of these things. So de-skilling, education is reproduction. Of course, as the 90s moved on, we had a critique of new public management. Many of you, have, you know, would think of, of Stephen Ball's work in schooling as an example of this, but people like Dennis Gleeson in the education sector writing about, uh, the FE sector writing about similar processes going on. So we had a critique of what was going on, how this was, you know, driving the system. And then a broader literature that's drawing from education, from sociology, from institutional economics, from geography, a whole range of disciplines that's tried to develop a political economy account of skills. Here I'm thinking of kind of the French regulationist school who were arguing that in the 1970s the advanced capitalist states had gone a changed into a new era where there was an argument that's been popularised as post-Fordism back then but now it's kind of gone into new knowledge-based economy kind of stuff more recently. You know, so we can't understand skills in this argument without understanding the systems of political economy. Why is the German variety of capitalism different from the English version? Why is that? What implications does that have for a skills system? So the way that work's organised, the way that unions are involved in the process, etc. So German capitalism, therefore German skills, looks different from French, looks different from English, looks different from Japanese. So you've got to understand the system in order to understand what's going on. You can't take a toolkit and drop it down in a decontextualised way. You've got to understand the context and the, the room for manoeuvre. What's happened, I think, and, and two countries I think have been most obvious exemplars in this in the last decade would be UK and South Africa. Similar kind of project, a new Labour, a new South Africa project, that we have to do something to change our system. We can do that in a progressive way, but we can do it in an economically competitive way under globalisation. And so a lot of us who were writing in the political economy of skills tradition also found ourselves working in more policy-oriented com uh, contexts, saying, well, okay, we understand all this stuff, so how can we change national systems for the better? And a lot of that was about taking a human resource development approach, trying to see the whole of the system, trying to understand that political economy above it. Well, what are the bits of industrial development? So, for instance, in South Africa, we were identifying the areas that we thought growth might come from. Okay, well, how do we fit a skills system that's going to prioritise um, biotechnology, that's going to prioritise um, ecotourism and, and trying to get ways of using sectoral structures and national planning structures influenced by East Asian ways of viewing the world to try and get the system working. So we kind of came from a left political economy tradition but we defaulted um, very quickly to using a toolkit and people like Leslie who were u working in, in reforming colleges um, you know, in, in this period, you know, that very much, w there were a set of tools here. Here are obvious things you try and do to change the system. And so it became a classic third way mix of progressive politics and outlooks and some what looked pretty neoliberal 
managerial tools thrown in there at the same time because these were the tools that were on offer. So the, there seemed to be this gap between the principles and what were the actual tools that you could put together with it. So that's all been about kind of literature about VET, but my title mentioned the word development, so it's about time that I came back to it. <coughs> now, again, in development, there's been a neoliberal orthodoxy, what was called a Washington Consensus. But actually, that's been under question, well, it's been on, under question throughout. You know, so there was a lot of literature against structural adjustment, for instance, in the 1980s. But really, from the early 90s, there's been a series of intellectual pro, um, projects fighting back and talking back to it. And partly it's been about other major structures from the United Nations and from international organisations offering different ways of viewing the world. So, of course, from the UN, human rights has, has always been at the heart of what, how the UN understands itself back from the Charter in <coughs> 1948. But what the Millennium Development Goals do, in my argument, is put a human rights perspective at the heart of a thinking about development. Now, that thinking isn't very strong about jobs, work, economic development, industrial development, but it's very strong about basic rights to health and education. And so that agenda came up to question a lot of this, that there's a right to these things. It doesn't matter what the economic... Um, results are but as it happened the research proved and that definitely in inverted commas that if you invested a little bit in girls education you got returns in terms of productivity and reduced fertility etc etc so it was it was also instrumental the second strand and we're 20 years on from rio um, a few weeks ago was to say sustainable development clearly had to be at the heart of this. Economic development was taking us to disaster. And so we've had the growth of an agenda around sustainability. And so the latest thing that's come out there is we should replace the Millennium Development Goals with a set of sustainable development goals, which is not quite clear what these are, um, but that's kind of last month's great idea in development that's still being played out. And you'll be glad to know that David Cameron is one of the lead people in sorting this out for us. So there's been an agenda that sustainability needs to be thought about. And of course, that, that's led to an argument that sustainability isn't just about the environment. It's got to be about economic sustainability and social sustainability. So a three-pronged approach. I think in practice, there has been work about vocational education training and this, but it tends to be about green skills. And so there's a very simple, but the danger is the whole debate gets domesticated into a nice safe. It's just about there are jobs in the green economy and we can change skills training a little bit towards the green economy. Rather than the bigger questions, and, and Sarah in her seminar here was raising these much bigger questions about sustainability <coughs> and what actually would a transformative approach to that require. A lot of the VET stuff has not been transformative. It's been about minor reforms and yeah here's an opportunity for training providers because there's going to be jobs in the green economy the third strand that has become very important and some of you work on this much more than me is the human development and capability strand really because of the UNDP the UN development program and their human development reports which have been going for 21 years 22 years this year 1990 they started and these very much tried to produce a different view of what development was about. And so they saw development as being about well-being and this notion of freedoms which comes directly from Sen's work, uh, flourishing which you know, we'll go into a bit more, about empowerment and agency. So more that was about the individual but in a, in a way that was trying to get away from the neoliberal and to a more kind of classically liberal we need to think about how individuals develop and with a strong justice strand. And so this clearly has developed theoretically much further through this kind of nice mixture of the UNDP producing reports every year on this and producing Human Development Index. And on the other hand, people have said in Nussbaum developing a, a theoretical approach to these issues. And I'm going to come back to, to that issue and how it relates to education and training in a couple of minutes. So this final, final section of what I want to say 
is, well, where do we go as trying to think about the relationship between vocational education, training and development? The first place where we could go is to think about capabilities. Now, there's been quite a lot of work about education and capabilities, but there's been very little about vocational education training and capabilities, although we do have P two PhD students working on this, who are world leaders in this field, aren't you? <laughs> so Aurora and Leslie, who are you know, right at the, the cutting edge of this, of this work, because it is very early. So how would we start to think about vocational education and training and capabilities? Well, the first thing I might do is quote McLean, well, Walker and McLean, to be strictly accurate, is in the, the work that, that Monica and Melanie did about um, pro-poor professionalism in South Africa, they came up with this list, and now, as, as Monica will, will, will insist quite rightly, th this is purely an exemplar of a set of capabilities that could be developed. But what I, when I start to think about vocational education training and capabilities, I think it's quite useful to, to use this as an example of what you could construct, taking the professional end of vocational. So what are the kind of things that people would value vocational education and training for? So I think that's you know, the starting point that this work start, you know, helps us to get towards. Um, then I think you know, the work that, as I say, Leslie and Aurora doing is very important here, you know, taking this further. Leslie's been using this notion of a capability to aspire in, in kind of early formulations of, of the thesis and tr both trying to understand what, what <coughs> vocational education and training might look from a cap at, like from a capabilities perspective. And importantly, as Aurora was saying in her seminar, a month or so ago, whenever that was, you know, you've got to bring in some stuff, it seems, that's much more explicitly about social justice, more political economy, in a sense, in there to balance the, the capabilities. But capabilities looks like it might be an area that opens up certain possibilities. I think it starts us to think about what is it that's important, not just narrow economics and narrow employability. Who has a voice in this? Now, most of the research by being economic or psychologi psychological has come with a view of what counts and then come down to the learners and tested the learners in the sense about against what the official view of what it is that matters. The capabilities approach comes much more from the bottom up and says, what do people imagine are the things that are important to them? So I think this is an area that's potentially quite important, but it's really early days in thinking about it in vocational. And it has this problem um, that capabilities, for me, has been a bit too nice and liberal and hasn't really got into the dirty end of, of kind of what work means. But I'd be very happy to explore that in the questions. Now, the second approach around well-being that's out there, which doesn't particularly attract me, but, it, but is quite powerful at the moment, is coming largely from the OECD. And it's much... So if, if capabilities end of it is saying, ask people what they value, have a social dialogue to determine what they value, the OECD approach is much more positivistic. It's saying, what are the things that matter? OK, we can measure these things. And we know that GMP is too narrow a definition of what matters. But let's put something in about mental health. Let's put something in about uh, longevity of life. And so, you know, one, one big centre at uh, University of London, the Centre for uh, Wider Benefits of Learning, has been doing this work. Look at all the benefits that education and training bring. They reduce smoking levels, they increase democracy, they reduce stress, they reduce mental health, they, you know, they do, all, it does all these things. And so this research is about kind of operationalizing all the things that vocational education training might do. And then of course, going in and seeing what evidence can you find? You know, so work in Australia, an apprenticeship brings these mental health benefits. That's not the kind of work that particularly is interesting to me, but it, clearly it's very powerful for policymakers. Look, you can have these things. So the OECD have brought out um, an index which has 11 elements, which I, I reference in the paper, of uh, the Better Life Index. 
So you can go in and look at different countries and you can do weightings. You can say, well, actually, I think mental health is more important than than economic sustainability or whatever. So you can play with the weightings and the countries will move in the rankings. So, you know, while away a happy hour. And then you'll have well-being, so that'll be good at the end of it. Uh, or maybe not, depending on how your mind works. So it's, it, it's an attempt to try and say it's about more than economic, but still quite top down. <laughs> and the third bit I want to get into is taking that word flourishing, which was in um, the slide that I took from, from Melanie and Monica's work, and explore this a bit further. So there's been a rise of work in the last couple of years that's wanted to go beyond well-being and capabilities and go back to human flourishing. And sometimes it actually refuses to use an English terminology at all and goes back to Aristotle and talks about eudaimonia. Because it, the argument being that none of these translations quite work. So it's trying to go back to this and say, well, what is the ultimate purpose? What are people actually bothered about? What would make a life that we see as flourishing? And I think that Aristotelian tradition, which clearly Nussbaum draws upon in, in the capabilities, is very open-ended. But it's intended to be practical in that you only get to flourish by living in the world and acting in the world, not by philosophizing the whole time. So it's saying people do this not by sitting and reflecting, but by finding a path through life and going through, you know, obviously reflection during that, but it's about finding a pathway that makes sense. At the heart of it, it's about striving to become more human. And so it's vocational in that older and spiritual and religious sense of vocational. So there's a vocation to become a better person. Now, clearly that links in, it has resonances with capabilities. It has resonances with a lot of the UNESCO tradition around Delors and Faure and the, the learning to be and, and those kind of things rather than learning just to do. So there are resonances there. I think it has resonances with, with John Dewey. And, and kind of, so there are lots of traditions it has resonances with. But I just want to explore it kind of from my own position of being interested in a um, particular strand of this. And this is where I came to this. So 20 years ago, and then kind of, I've only come back to some of this stuff recently, which is out of, I was a Catholic social teaching, and so I just want to take a few strands from that, because I think I'm now thinking in a way that I didn't when I first came to it, that it does something that the other literatures don't quite do. So I'm going to try and kind of quickly say some of the things I think it might do. Obviously it has a transcendental view of human development, which ultimately is, you know, is a foundational decision which you either take or don't take. But as part of that, it's saying that human development is broader than the simple economic. But it, it has a few key things in it. I think it has a stress on duty as well as rights. So you have a duty to help other people flourish as well as looking after your own flourishing. And my hesitation about some of the liberal account is that they can be too individualistic. They're about how I come to be a better person in the world. But that's my business. But a notion in this that there's a broader duty to the community within that and to society. Um, and its key notion is human dignity. So this com notion of the common good, which is quite important, what I've just been saying, you know, that the common good is important as well as the individual good. And that links on to a notion of solidarity. It's not enough that I'm okay, but it matters that other people are okay around me. And then for those who, who study the EU, the word subsidiarity probably causes nightmares as what does this word mean? <coughs> but a notion that things should be done as close to the ground as it's possible to do them, I suppose is, is the key thing. So you don't need to take a decision. It's, in a sense, it's localism, which is a very loaded word at the moment now. But the, what I take as a positive side of that, why do I have to wait for central government to tell me if I want to do something in my community? The community level should be able to decide certain things, but it should know when to refer up. And so, you know, 
there's appropriate levels to do things at. But the other thing that I think this approach does that's really important for me is that it puts work at the centre of the approach. So there's a very clear link between what are being said in these texts and an explicit link to the ILO and the decent work agenda. So it's not good enough for people to have work, but that work should be decent. It should be work that's not unsafe. It should be work that's actually enriching people. Work should <coughs> increase human dignity, not be something that's about just surviving in appalling conditions. It says that work is an integral part of being human, and so we need to see that. Work is something we do as humans, as long as we don't narrowly define it as paid work in the formal economy. But work is something we do, it's part of being human, so we need to have that perspective. And so, of course, that links off into UNESCO and, and the law and fairy. It links back to Dewey. I think it links particularly to Christopher Winch, who I would see as the leading philosopher of vocational education and training internationally at the moment, who's focused on the moral purpose of vocational education, a process of becoming, often for young people, because that's where much of it takes place, but through adulthood as well. So an attempt, as I say here, and I'm only starting to sketch these things out, these are work in progress seminars, and this work feels like when I agree the seminar, I thought the progress would have been greater, whereas it feels like I now have to do the work to progress on the ideas. So these are ideas of kind of, that partly, so the paper in a sense, half is kind of building on a paper I already have, and half is looking towards where I want to go with that writing, but I'm not there yet. And it's in a sense this kind of back end of the paper, and particularly getting to this end, that I would love to have some time to, to try and think more about. So that's where I'm trying to head towards. And so I'm just going to, this is the last couple of paragraphs of, of my paper. So I'm concerned that we're moving, be, you know, to move beyond employability. I'm not saying employability isn't important, but I want to try, and it's, it's a, in a sense, it's deliberately a polemical, a, a debating position, is to push for the, the philosophical and the moral and the broader vocational rather than the narrow employability, which clearly is powerful. Of course, jobs matter. Any job matters. When you're young and you've got no money, when you're older, you've got no money, jobs are important. So it's not that employability isn't <coughs> important but we need to rephrase it and reframe it and so my argument is if we just look at that narrow stuff we're impoverishing, impoverishing ourselves and those and more likely not ourselves because this isn't for us it's for those people over there and their lives can be impoverished because they're not important and so that's really what I want to try and argue in this but I need to push it much further okay thanks yeah. thank you very much Fascinating contribution, and I'm going to throw it open straight away rather than hooking the limelight. <laughs> yes. You mentioned briefly uh, the fact that, in your view, the concept of capabilities didn't go into the dirty end in terms of engaging with the notion of work. Yeah. And that you could explain that later if somebody has a question. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, Philippe. Uh, yeah, I, I, and I'd be interested, you know, um, others, there are several people here who work probably more with capabilities than I have, but I mean, part, partly this was kind of n nagging away at me, and then since I was at a conference a few months back, and it was someone, I was talking to someone who'd just been to the capabilities big conference, and she was saying how frustrated she was that she was an economist who was coming to capabilities. Um, and she felt that she w that conversation wasn't taking place. She'd gone to this conference for three, four days and not found anyone to talk to. And it was kind of reflecting on, you know, it's linking to my it's reflections. Like yeah, to exactly. <laughs> but, but, you know, that I, w I wasn't quite sure when you, you know, capabilities is kind of over here 
and development theory of kind of more conventional development theories over here and what the gap was and, and also it kind of linked partly back to Aurora's seminar. So I'll, I'll get her to answer the question. <laughs> you know, and you were saying that you felt that you needed to bring in people like Standing and yeah. some others because it didn't seem to do some of the work around social justice and When you and, mentioned and work. work, for instance, yeah. that we have had that conversation yeah. through email, mm. the difference that the Standing is bringing, that is also the classics, that is the difference between work and labour. Is something that in the capability is not touched. So, I mean, work as any activity that every human does in this part of uh, humanity, that uh, it's, uh, he says that work should be something that we can have our own time, our own autonomy, and our own schedule. No? So, we have a control about it. And labor will be more alienation, more linked to the world. You just exchange uh, your uh, skills for money. So, it's something that in the capability, in the, in, the, in the writings of the capability people, they enhance work as good per se, and it's not questioned enough if you want to talk then about BET, that is very important because what a lot of people in a, in a very narrow curricula of BET, then you are providing maybe labor, not work. So is that enough emphasized or not? So I see that, that gap and then I had, I had the feeling to bring other, other theorists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. I, I think yeah. that that's right. It's not that the capability approach doesn't have work as an important capability. I mean, Nussbaum has it as one yeah. of the yeah. comprehensive yes. universal. Yeah. But the discussion of the of the nature and quality of work isn't there. Mm. Mm. But you could, you know, you could go to Marx or yeah. Hegel yeah, yeah. Or, yes. or, or indeed Freud. I, yes. I'm not sure you need Catholic encyclicals, do you? If you see what I mean. Well, I mean, there there are kind of these big. Yeah. theories that can help you think mm. about the difference between work as self-realization and work as alienation. Yeah. 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 I think the real gap is when you think about the cap sorry, okay. sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, thanks, Jim. I couldn't see I couldn't see where the voice was coming from. I think the real gap is when you think about education in terms of within the framework of the capabilities approach because the way that the capabilities approach has been applied to education really doesn't really we really haven't covered the role of education as preparing people for work in terms of it. It's been a very liberal application of it for the most part in the education to learn. So when you work in VT, you can't really work within that framework because VT is about vocational <coughs> education and training. So you challenge to then look at the capabilities approach in a broader way and draw in other theoretical frameworks if if you're using the capabilities approach to think through how you're going to deal with this aspect of it. So for me, it was really the gap in terms of education. But there are capabilities. There are people in the frame who work within the framework, like Bonvin and so on, are thinking a bit about what capabilities and work means, but they're not thinking about capabilities and work and education together. Mm. Yeah. And it's an empirical question always yeah. when you're working with capabilities, because there are professional capabilities. It didn't just come out of the air. It no. came out of talking yeah, to Yeah, exactly many groups of stakeholders yeah. about yes. what they thought yeah. were the kind of capabilities you need to be yeah. specifically a public good professional. Yeah. So yeah. it depends what kind of context mm -hmm. yeah. you're working in. Yeah. Yes. And part of the problem that, uh, uh, you know, I suppose part of it's a kind of, it's methodological and, and well, it's epistemological, it's, it's ideological, you know, of who's asking questions in vocational education and training. To whom? To whom. Yeah. And, and for what purpose? And it, may, and it seems to me, maybe I'm romanticising higher education, that there's a bit more space in the higher education field to, yeah, to have those conversations. Yeah, yeah. And so it's partly, it's, you know, can we push so we can have <laughs> similar kind of conversations about, well, what is this for? Yes. As an alien, let me just ask. Um, <laughs> to me, it, uh, there's the issue of generalizability. Mm -hmm. We actually did a study years ago about uh, maths needed in work. <coughs> and so on. But, uh, you know, there's huge critiques of courses on golf course management. Mm -hmm. And those who teach them would argue that they're actually teaching management which is very generalizable and they happen to t take a particular context for doing it. Similarly, at a um, le perhaps less elevated level, we, what we found was that, and I'm sure this is part of your literature, 
that the technician, the, 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 the worker in a small firm uh, acquired more general skills than yeah. if they're working, you know, electricians working for Wimpy, yeah. where all they ever do is connect that plug yeah. to that socket. Yeah. Uh, is generalizability part of this um, humanizing of the work labor thing? I think I think it could be, you know, in, in in different ways. I think what you know what you're saying about the specifics then leads to that kind of problem of well, if training is incredibly context specific, and you'd want to you know take that into account on the one hand, what happens if you are working for Wimpy's as opposed to a small contractor, and and is that a matter of concern for? anyone and should it be a matter of concern so on that level of generalizer you know are the skills generalizable well not easily some skills clearly are but others skills will not get even if they're taught they won't get learned and reinforced because they won't get used in the workplace so you could give the same program to the person at Wimpy but arguably they'd lose the skills in one or two years because they never use them what do we do about that so there's a generalizability of skills issue but there's a generalizability of what should is there something that we hold to be important in the educative function of vocational education training that has to be generalizable for for citizenship for national nation building for whatever that is so that's kind of how it might get rephrased another way so what you know what is what do we mean by generalizable and what you know what do yeah, we want to hold thinking in more that? Of, the, of the job satisfaction yeah. as well mm -hmm. they, yeah. know, they've discovered that it's better to Allow somebody on a production line to make the yeah. whole car, sure, and not just yeah. tighten that nut. Yeah, and uh, you know the pride of the German workforce and so yeah. on and so forth. Yeah. yeah, although that's under threat, by the way, that the that you know, <coughs> although that it, it depends what you it better in terms of self actualization, but it may not be better in terms of profit margins. Right. And there, you know, how does that then, be, you know, so that's a lot of what the political economy literature would be saying is, but actually it comes down to profit margins. And the German model was distinctive and was seen by many people as better. But of course, it came out of many things, including, you know, trying to make the country work after the war. And, you know, it came to a model that worked, but it's increasingly, well, you know, in the 90s, it was seen that it wasn't working as well as the, the British or American if you took short term answers now it might not again it might not look that you know you'd be looking to britain rather than germany as there's the answer They're doing all right yes yeah. you know so some of it is it, you know that literature would insist these are always contextual and it's a high prestige of vocational trade uh, education yeah. training <clears throat> yeah i mean that's part of and the so then the question is what what you know why is the i suppose one you know one set of questions is why is the german more high prestige higher quality than the british and once we've understood that, is there anything we can do here? And that's where I think the political economy very quick, you know, we certainly in South Africa, we, we did the critique of why the South African system was so bad. And then it was, well, OK, how do we improve it? Including conversation, I remember one, you know, interview from my PhD work where someone said to me, look, the Germans have got the best system in the world, but ours is so bad. We could aspire to being like the English, because the English isn't as bad as ours. You know, maybe in 20, 30 years we'll aspire to being like the Germans. But, you know, we could maybe achieve being as bad as the English. But we couldn't, you know, Germany's just, you know, that's, that's serious. I, I really found the presentation really interesting for me, and I had a couple of comments and yeah. ideas to share with all of you. First of all, I think. As far as my experience is, we don't need to go as far as Kenya. Yeah. I know that in Italy, I mean, I come from Italy, I know in Italy that they will run the same uh, way of doing vocational training. They get the money, they get the student to sign a paper, they never deliver, and they ask a teacher to sign the same paper of attendance, which is not so far <laughs> We have the same problem. Um, yeah, I'm picking more on the World Bank than the Kenyans here <laughs> for designing a stupid project. <laughs> so the, the, the same problem, I guess, in some other parts of Europe. Uh, to get the, the money from the EU and then never deliver the project they meant to. Um, 
The second one was about, I'm really interested in the idea of um, redefining human dignity and uh, morality, because of course it's a changing, um, it's a world, and what you attach to this world is changing yeah. throughout yeah. history. Yeah. And it is quite interesting how this um, less importance of religion, especially in mm. Europe, has led this neoliberal uh, attachment to the idea of labor, human dignity, and how can we envisage in the future a new way of defining human dignity and um, yeah, and common good, which could be feasible for a society. This yeah. is a bit the challenge of definition uh, and morality. What do you attach to the word morality? And um, the, the last comment, but I don't know if I'm really adding as well on the VET. Um, and I don't know much about it, but it's not the best to give the, the money instead of a teacher or a person trained that needs to train others, directed to a uh, company or businessmen to train and then allow them for one year contract instead of spending money to teachers or um, external uh, schools or uh, now I don't know how does it work is in colleges or schools. <coughs> it's not bad to give directly the money to the businessmen because they know what the skills they need and they might use the money instead of paying a teacher <laughs> to give him a six months or a year contract. I don't know actually how does yeah. it work but it is a kind of provocation on yeah instead of teaching <laughs> create jobs. Uh, okay let me com let me respond to two things there. One that to crudely paraphrase what you said employers know best is one of the most controversial issues in, the, in this field. Um, in what ways are employer, do they have perfect information? To what extent are they rational economic actors? Um, you know, are, are questions here, obviously by the time you get up to a large company, who's making the decision? Is it a HR director rather than certainly not the CEO because you know CEO needs to have non deniability about anything. Um, so so there are problems, you know, and, and there is a part of that political economy tradition would talk. You know, one variety of that, one variant of that, was a low skill equilibrium argument that in again because of cultural factors in some countries, there's a tendency towards doing the minimum and in other countries there's a tendency to do a lot more England Germany so Germany would see that it made sense to train because other people were training because the qual training quality was good because working conditions were relatively good and so there's a virtuous circle between investment in workers <coughs> in company organization in productivity in technological development in export markets <coughs> Or you kind of went cheap, you know, pile it high, sell it cheap. You know, skills actually don't matter. And so, you know, so that's been one of the tensions in that. I would say there's also obviously questions about, it depends on, on, on what, you're, what you're training for. You know, I suppose one of the classics of the, when national vocational qualifications came here, one of my favourites, I think, was the NVQ level one in, in, in shelf stacking. Um, which, how many hours, you know, obviously you, you, know, you need to know about lifting safely, you need to know about rotation of stock, so you don't just keep always putting the new stuff up front and the old stuff's at the back, but... How, how long does that take relative to, because there was funding and a certificate attached, how long did it take? So the, certainly there are problems there that would be better to employ more people and teach them on the job than to have certificates, but there was money from the state to do it. Um, I th obviously, your, your, your question about you know, human dignity, its changing role, etc., is a deep philosophical question that at one point I thought I was going to get further into and it's kind of what, you know, how do we come up with a set of agreed principles on things? The, how many versions of liberal philosophy and that include capabilities within that is a kind of practical reasoning, dialogue process where we will use a process and I suppose it's an, you know, it's kind of Habermas would link in there as well. You know, we can imagine 
a ideal communicative space where this can take place. Now, I suppose I, I kind of come to that, I think, with two diametrically opposed positions. One is, yeah, I think that I, I kind of, I tend to think, yes, that's an ideal, but it's an ideal and I'm not sure the world works like that. I'm sure, you know, I'm convinced we can work at it and make it better, but I kind of tend to fall back into a political economy view pretty quickly that power plays out in particular ways in this. So, so, but that's clearly how many liberal philosophical positions would, would go. And a lot of people who are, you know, have done far more reading and thinking than me for me to dismiss that as I almost just did. So that clearly wasn't, you know, was... But I, th I agree with you. I think there's then a challenge about, so what is foundational? Something that for me was very interesting was a few years ago when there was um, a th quite a short volume produced, which was the record of uh, a dialogue between... Ratzinger, as he was then, and Habermas about where's the Enlightenment project going. And I think that's a really interesting text in terms of what is the foundational basis from which you can make any moral claims. And obviously on one, on one level, Ratzinger had an easier position to defend as long as you accepted his first principle, which of course is where a lot of people would, would have, um, you know, party company with him. But once you've got a theology of this, it's of course much easier to, to talk about a set of moral principles than it is in a, in a more liberal way of trying to develop those through a, through a social dialogue. So that's, you know, that's as an area where I thought I could have been sidetracked in this into quite a way and it's an important issue, but I kind of skipped it in the end. Yes, the I, I, I thought you were a bit sort of quiet on the Pope. I, I, that was my feeling. You know, compared with, with the paper, yeah. I thought... For the Pope, Pope and localism, Pope. I was looking for a... Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. On that. I, I mean, right. also, the, you know, humanist... Yeah. Uh, you know, standard humanist uh, mm. moral ethics are not very different. No. From religious ones. It's between the humanists and Ayn Rand, which is a more interesting yeah. group. But, 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 uh, could, 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 I, could I just raise, yeah. I mean, this, this is where I, mm. I sort of come along with you, I think. I mean, I, I, I think back to, um, to uh, you know, tr traditions of, well, well, you know this, workers' education yeah. in this country. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think, you know, all the, the, all the big names in that field, you know, Temple, Tawney, Livingston, yes, would, would, are, are, yes. or a lot of the big names, yes. are all come out of Christian Christi yes. Christian thinking, in that in their yeah. case, yeah, uh, Christian, Anglican Christian. Thinking, you know, thinking. But yeah. there's something which which uh, comes there from a, if you like, a spiritual position, which, yeah. uh, which clearly drives them into mm. this kind of sense yeah. of service and human good. So there's, yeah. there's that in the early 20th century. It's yeah. not the only motive, but yeah. it's partly there in yeah. and, sure. and so on as well. Yeah. In, in, in the mid 20th century, you then get, you then get a, a, a much, that seems to be displaced by, again in the same, by a lot of uh, what you might call sort of, um, well, for want of a better word, sort of neo-Marxist kind of thing. Mm. I'm thinking of Raymond Williams and, yeah. and, the, yeah. and the like. Mm. I'm not sure who the like are in this case. Yeah, but, but Williams will do yeah. I mean, I, I think, think Raymond Williams, Williams writes a book called... Sorry? Yeah, yeah. 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 that writes a book yeah. called The Common Good. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's yes. the kind of concept that yeah. he's using. Yeah. You, you find it. So yeah. so what what is it... Uh, and clearly all these people are engaged in some way in, mm. you know, some sense of public service. That's, that's the kind of underpinning... Um, um, yeah. practice that they're engaged yeah. in. Uh, some of them see it as, as coming out of you yeah. know, um, religious theology, blah, 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 in some sense, yeah. although not. Yeah. So it's, it's also closely, lo relate, closely related with both of them to some sense of the, di the dignity, not, of, not simply of work, but of labour. You know that yes. that's us. Yeah. Um, and I think that. So I think that 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 is. Or no, I mean the other the other names I've stuck down here are Marx, who so yeah. you mentioned, yeah, but, but Morris and people like that. Yeah. So if you could take sure. it back in the nineteenth yeah. century, yeah. you get the same kind yeah. of thing. Exactly. Um, so and I think what I was doing was was yeah, I think that's very useful, John. And, and you know certainly, you know some of those you know some of those are sources familiar to me, like Tawney and, and Williams. But you know it's it's. I think what I was trying to do was say. 
how do we open out this debate? Let me take a line that makes sense mm. to me, you know, that that makes my positionality in, in this clear, but, you know, the, there are other brands available. Um, Sorry, and then... Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be quite personal here, but yeah. it, it, it makes me, I feel very uncomfortable about religion being connected to kind of policy and public issues. And uh, partly this is because Catholicism is also my tradition, but a mm. rejected tradition. Mm. So I kind of feel probably I'm more militant atheist than anything, but not in the sense that I don't think that people should be absolutely free to kind yeah. of practice religion in their yeah. own places. And partly, my question then is, since we can find, if you like, some universal foundation values in, you know, uh, old fashioned humanism or the ethic of public service or indeed in capabilities where dignity for Nusbaum is foundational, yeah. the dignity of the human being, yeah. and, and Sen certainly has this notion of access to, to yeah. capabilities means obligation to others. Why would we draw on religion to upset people like me? <laughs> <laughs> because people like you are upsetting people like me by saying we can't say it. Yeah. Okay. But, but in a public arena, I mean, uh, to, to, to come to an agreement. F uh, Philippe wants to come in on that. You, you want to come? Did you, do you want, are you on different Should we do that one and then come? Uh, no, go on. Let's follow up that yeah. one. Yeah. 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 Okay. I wasn't planning to answer you, but I had this thing a long time ago, and I think it, it kind of counts as a response. Yeah. Um, it's just from my personal experience, I, so, you know, take it and leave it. But um, I'm thinking, you can look at these things, whether it's, it's Catholicism or, or it's new public ma management or it's, or it's any system at work in an enterprise. You can look at it as a sort of ideology. And I think every place, every space has something that it runs on. It's a sort of ideology or a mini ideology or some fragmented thing, but, but it's there. And I was thinking about the Kenyan example and the Italian example. And, and I was thinking, well, Simon presentation links to that in a way in the, in the last part of the paper, because it speaks about the fact that when the, in, the intentions, when there is not a moral reason, a meta-level reason, than just profit, and I'm not talking about just moral aims, when you don't have something greater, when you, you don't link your work with something greater, when you don't see your work as, as being positive in some way, then you don't have any motivation to behave you know, in, in, uh, according to the rules. And what happens is you, there is this ideology which is centralized, is imposed on you, but you, you, you have to agree with it, you have to play the game. To some extent you do agree with it, but also to a large extent you un undermine it. And what is happening in these places for me, in Kenya and Italy, is that besides the social issues and corruption in general, people are already undermining this VAT ideology, whether it's the teacher or it's that participant. In their minds, they have already undermined it. They do not think this will create a problem to the VAT system as a whole, or to society, or, or to this person. There is no attachment to that ideology that is being there, whatever that VAT ideology in that place is. So, I don't know if that makes any sense. Does it make any sense so far? What I'm trying to say, basically, is um, there needs to be an ideology, even if it's greater, and if it's, if, if it's moral, or even if it's religious, there needs to be something at a meta level that motivates and keeps the order in, 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 in this place. Uh, the place can be big or small. It, I mean, be, the it can be an enterprise, like where, where sometimes I work part time and I have to smile all the time. And the notion of being a customer <laughs> is you have to smile. Uh, nobody, I mean, people smile, but nobody, nobody can really care, you know, you know that even your employer doesn't care about the customer. <laughs> so you will, you will smile, but at the same time you will undermine it. Sometimes you will undermine it to take care of the customer, and sometimes you just undermine it because you think this is useless. <laughs> there is an empirical support, uh, <laughs> sorry to be so basic, but uh, I mean, if the well-being uh, empiricism is very 
you know, it's, it's shaky, but it's a, a good attempt. Everybody believes there's more than the GDP yeah. like. Yes, that's probably. And the spirit level mm. yeah, is, I think it's is very empirical support yeah. for the idea that mm. more equal countries mm. with a tradition, with a tradition, with a habit, with a culture mm. of the common good actually have very much higher levels of well-being or happiness or whatever you want to call it uh, than those who are uh, I mean, there is a philosophy, the Ayn Rand philosophy, which is, uh, if, I, if you're so smart, how come you ain't rich? Uh, but that doesn't actually prove to be productive as the, you know, the current situation in the US, where I spend a lot of time. No, it's, it's, it's total chaos there, really. I, 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 I just think, um, for me, there's a sort of gap here in terms of... Um, what about the trainers? Mm. And what about the parents mm. uh, and the employers? Mm. And if they don't value this, then um, we can talk about it, but it won't improve. It just, yeah. So, for example, those professional, the, the vet capabilities that were listed, I think they were listed in terms of um, how they could be produced in people who'd been trained. Um, but what I thought when I looked at it was, well, for that to work, I think those capabilities have to be yeah. in the trainers. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, my, my area is sort of further education in, in this country. And I think there's a huge amount of dysfunctionality there in terms of the trainers. And I think it's not so much that they don't think vocational education and training is important but they are kicking against the bit on there about um, the narrow interpretation of it. Do you, do you know what I mean? Just this very narrow political um, by this government and others. Um, you know, we just want to actually just show we're trying to do something about unemployment and needs and so let's have a big push and throw some money in there and you've just got to deliver it. and. We've seen in some countries you can do that incredibly cynically. But even if it's done legitimately, in this country, it's still not done well. Do you, do you know what I mean? Because the trainers don't actually believe in what they're doing. And so, not sure where this gets us. It sounds really negative, but I, I actually think that it's, it's very, you know, I'm very, very interested in this notion of how uh, any type of education can contribute to human flourishing, if you like, and and I think it's particularly tricky with with that because of the political context. But just one more <coughs> quick point, I think as well because of, in Britain again going back to parents, I think because we've had this industrial, you know, all that stuff about um, vocational work was seen as very dirty work, mm. and it killed people. Mm. Then as a parent, you wanted better for your child and so that contributed to this push to academic learning and going to university and doing a level and not touching anything vocational with a barge pole i think we've we've come out of that but i'm not sure it's been replaced by anything anything more tangible yet do you know what i mean people could understand that you were going to do something vocational when the jobs were there but now the jobs aren't there where does that leave vocational education in this country I think certainly, you know, the, the way that, you know, and, and Monica can come in, and it's, you know, there was an intention to under in, in your capabilities, which I'm using. It senses a kind of this is a, a method one might use. You were talking to Students, teachers, teachers, learners, in end users, yeah, you know, state, you know, yeah, so yeah, a range yeah, of yeah, stakeholders. Range so it's about, you know, because yeah. I guess my, you know, at the heart of my concern is that we've got a version of of what people want and need, but it's a version cooked up by a very small group of people, often yeah. policymakers, who don't actually yeah. speak for industry. Yeah. Um, certainly don't speak for small business if they do speak for industry. You know, don't speak mm. for learners, for communities, for parents. And some kind of, of way of trying to get out what people want and value seems vital because I think yeah. what is going on is that people are forced to pay lip service to, to things that they don't believe in <coughs> and that, you know, they're smiling but it's not reaching their eyes and yeah. it's not reaching their hearts and they're not doing the job in a way that, that works. Mm. Listen. Just, just a, a comment. Um, 
Maybe just some background. I'm South African and my work for the last um, maybe two decades has been on the South African Fair Education training system, which is a kind of VET system. And I think this work is really important, the, the work that Simon's doing. And even though we might not all agree on the answers that he's putting forward, I think the questions that he's raising is critical. And the question of which developmental model sits and underpins our VET system, the question of what does this mean in terms of curriculum, institutional culture thereafter, that th those questions are critical. And in South Africa, we keep hitting our head against those same questions. And we're in another phase of development where we just develop another, yet again, um, post-schooling green paper. And the same, these are the questions sitting underneath the paper, but which are not being confronted directly. At no point have we, as a group of researchers or um, policy researchers or our policy makers, have we actually sat down and asked this question directly? Because to ask it would be to challenge so much of what we've assumed about the basis of which we built the system on, to be honest. And so I think for me, this, the, the power behind this work for the South African situation, maybe for the Italian, maybe for the Spanish, maybe for the Kenyan, I don't know, is the questions that it raises. And it, it, it challenges us to go back to our own systems and to ask those questions again and to play around perhaps with different models of answering it or maybe similar models of answering it. But for me, that's the, that's, that's the power of it. So thanks, Simon. I think this work is really useful. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to pick on her, on, on, on where she talked about um, the issue about the training and what people are training and whether they believe in it or not, just to give go back to my country and look at it, and probably generally in many African countries, is that probably in most cases, like uh, when it comes to vocational education and training, it's just picked especially because it's been given prominence by the probably the donors and that one becomes I mean and because of that it's not really that we want it because we want to achieve this we want to train our people because we want them for our children maybe our young people because we want them to, to gain this skill for to produce this because we want to be competitive in this is probably because oh this is what the development partners want this is what they are supporting this is what they are willing to fund and because of that now, even what you want, even if I'm coming up with a policy, it's not a policy I'm believing in with a vision, but it's a policy which I'm just developing because this is what the donors want. And I've, I've, I've been in Kenya and I've attended, I mean, I've been called for a meeting and I've been told, somebody has told us, oh, we should do like this, like this. And in fact, you need, a, 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 at the end of it all, you need the work plan and it should look like this because that is how the donors want it. They want you do this, 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 this matrix and at the end that's what they want. And when it's like that, then definitely not much is going to be achieved. And that is why there's very little being achieved and I'm surprised that Italy, some of the things have, which happened in Kenya is happening also in Italy. And um, it's going to continue like that. If like now the GMR report is coming out like they are re-energizing that mm. and that is where everybody's going to go into now because they're saying there's funding here there's likely to be funding here mm. and also this issue about vocational education with the point that uh, 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 Simon started with about that there's no that uh, I mean it's, it's seen as something for those who have failed in school you know those who can't manage uh, uh, to get a white collar job mm. so and that is the effect, especially in our countries which went through colonialism. Mm. Because it's now viewed from those days it was being seen from the colonial period, how it was seen. It still remains a very, very serious issue. Mm. So unless we go back and look at it critically and say, why, what is vocational education and training and how good is it going to be for us? What do we want to produce? We may not produce compete with Britain or to, with, with Japan, but we can produce goods which we can compete with amongst us African countries. So I think 
it's it's a big deal problem, but the political part of it is a major, major part. It's a major point. And as as long as politicians are not going to look at it like that, it's still going to be seen as probably a cash cow, I'll say. Any more? Oh, I'll allow one more. Really? Plus me. Yes. <laughs> no, uh, just, it was really important the, the dirty bit you mentioned before about work. And it reminded me the idea that democracy was founded and still based on corruption. Mm. So again, we have a really <laughs> academic view of the world more than reality. And that's a really challenge for us, Procession, to capture and improve the dirty bit more than the nice theoretical approach. And the other one, I mean, uh, you were saying about why religion needs to have a say on that. And I found myself, it is interesting for me to be in the next generation and how this uh, polarized uh, attitude towards religion has been taken place. In, in public sphere. Yeah, yeah. For, for me, I think that it's important that religion can have different level of um, understanding. <coughs> and I think one point that can be interesting in public sphere is the principles, the values, more than all the spiritual and if God exists or not, it's just a personal understanding. But I think there's one aspect that I'm more happy to, to see in the next paper on your future um, development is how those values and principles that can apply uh, to any person in the world, basically, that's why we have Christians or Muslim spread around the world. How can those values, principles, can ever say in our spiritual life? And, and it's really interesting nowadays. We are all interesting on the, not much on the employability on skills, but what is missing is the social, the spiritual, and the human parts. And as well, last, last time there was a presentation on how play and game can have a positive effect on the workplace through it was Rebecca presenting uh, and how you can improve as well the way you respond uh, to work challenges and tension and you can ease out uh, your skills and your uh, stress within the workplace with games. So again, the human being is more complex as we said than just employability. Uh, right. Uh, I'm, I think, uh, do, do you want to respond? No, to no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of wrap it up, I think, with, with, with great thanks to you, Simon, for what, what I think has led to a fascinating debate. I'm going to make the final, a final <laughs> comment, which is that I think we got through the whole of a seminar on vocational education and training without mentioning trade unions. Which I think is intriguing. I think um, I mentioned them in an answer. Okay. But yes. But, yes. Um, and I think I think it says something yes. about the way yes. the world has moved. Yeah. And uh, and yeah. I would bring it Very back to so. when you quote the ILO's decent work campaign. Mm. Maybe uh, with, glowingly, I think. Um, maybe the fact that the ILO has that position is because trade union yeah. interests are locked absolutely, into absolutely. the ILO in a way which they aren't into other. Uh, international yeah. organisations. Yeah. However, mm. that's my final comment. No, thank you very thank much, Simon, you. for a very fascinating paper. No, thank, thank you all. all. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll talk to you in 2012-13. Have a good summer. No, that's most unlikely. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's going to get better next week. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, I think there's a, there's a history to it, isn't there? About how are you? Why it is, but how it is that these kind of, as it were, lunatics, the kind of thing that we use. Are you going to? Yeah. Well, I mean, we'll have to know about the importance of the training of the fire over. I'm going to go to the office. I'm going to go to the office. Yes. When yeah, they are, 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 they
Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, if you go, you turn left to the mile, and then it will be you kind of, you know, can the side edge of the mile. So it's kind of, yeah, 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 yeah,